Hello guys, welcome back to another video on my channel. In this video, I am going to be proving the Basel problem. I've already made a playlist on it, but this method is extremely, extremely elegant. Probably my favorite proof. So let's get started so in the unmost unlikeliest of places we start with a circle of radius r centered at point o and uh, we have this triangle oab where b is just another point on the circle uh, so the arc ab actually uh, you know subtends an angle theta when uh, sort of extended back to join the origin. And we also have this point C such that the distance AC is capital H. Now distance OB and OA are actually the same because it's a circle, they're all small r. So if we look at triangle OAB and we wanna find the area, well, let's call that area one. That's half times base times height. So the base here is simple, it's R, but the height is a little difficult to see. Well, if you draw a, a perpendicular line that joins B, a perpendicular line to OA that joins B, that will be the height. And that has value of R times sine theta using trigonometry. So we have area one equals RH over two equals R squared sine theta over two. Now sector OAB, if we look at that, if you, you wanna find the area of that, let's call that area two. Now sector OAB, since it's a sector, has area one half R squared and the angle subtended which is theta in this case, by definition. So we're gonna have r squared theta over two. In triangle OAC, moving on, we have, uh, let's call that area three. The area of that, again, using the same formula, and this in this case, it happens to be a right angle triangle. So the height is just capital H. The base is r again. Now the thing is we can find h in terms of uh, theta and r. If you look at the triangle, h is just r times tan theta because we know what the base is and, uh, you know, we know the theta. We don't know what the uh, the opposite side is. So that is r times tan theta. So we're going to get r squared tan theta over 2. Now, we have the inequality area 1 is less than area 2 is less than area 3. Let me break that down for you. Area 1 is the area of this uh, OAB triangle. That is less than area two because area two is the sector. So that sector is essentially just the triangle OAB, except it has this curved white part. Let me zoom in on that. It has this excess curved white part that this green triangle does not account for. So in a way, this triangle is actually contained inside uh, the sector OAB. So, you know, this the first part of this inequality makes sense. Area one is less than area two. But is that less than area three? Well, that's even more simple to see because area three is just the big triangle OAC. And that contains all of these guys. It contains the sector and therefore by extension contains triangle OAB. Okay, now if we move on, after this inequality, we have r squared sine theta over two less than r squared theta by two less than r squared tan theta by two, uh, canceling out all the r factors in the one half, we get sine theta is less than theta is less than tan theta. You might say, well, why have you excluded the, the equality? Why is it just a strict inequality? It's because I'm considering theta between zero and pi over two. If theta were zero, if zero were inclusive in the range, then we would get an equality between the three. 
we want to avoid that because in the next step, we're actually going to flip this inequality. We're going to get one over theta, which wouldn't have been possible if zero were in the range. So we have cosecant theta is greater than one over theta is greater than cotangent theta. We square everything. We get cotangent squared less than one over theta squared less than cosecant squared, which is just one plus cotangent squared theta. Now we can set theta equal to k pi over 2n plus 1, where k is an integer that's between 1 and n, capital N. So when we plug all of this in, we get cot cotangent squared k pi over 2n plus 1 less than 2n plus 1 squared over k squared pi squared less than 1 plus cotangent squared k pi over 2n plus 1. Now, since we since it's the Basel problem we're trying to solve, we just want uh, 1 over k squared. So we can uh, divide by the, the prefactor, which is 2n plus 1 squared over pi squared on both sides. So, yeah, it's, this, this step's pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to elaborate more on this. Now, all that remains for this to be the Basel problem is actually a sum. Instead of summing directly from uh, 1 to infinity, I'm going to sum from k equals 1 to n on both sides. And then take the limit. So in this step, I just introduce a sum on everywhere. And then in the, in the step after that, in the, the step in the different blue shade, I'm, I'm going to take the limit externally like this. So when I do that, the strict inequalities become... Uh, uh, well, it they, they lose their strictness. This is because of uh, a result in analysis that says that uh, limits don't respect strict inequalities and actually instead change them into uh, not non-strict non inequalities. So when I do that, I have limit on the left side, which is pi squared over 2n plus 1 squared, sum from k equals 1 to n, cotangent squared k pi over 2n plus 1, less than or equal to, now I can just directly take the limit, k equals 1 to infinity 1 over k squared is less than or equal to, well, just the same thing, except we have this extra term apart from the cotangent, which is n pi over 2n plus 1 squared in the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay, so I mean, this first term is essentially uh, just zero, because if you take the limit on just this first term, we have n pi over 2n plus 1 whole squared. So the, the highest power in the denominator is n squared, and the numerator is it's an n. So the denominator dominates, and therefore, the limit as n goes to infinity, it goes to zero. So this first term is just we can remove that, and therefore we get a homogeneous bound for some from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k squared which is it's bounded both from the bottom and the top by pi squared over 2n plus 1 whole squared k plus k equals 1 to n sum of cotangent squared k pi over 2n plus 1 in the limit as n goes to infinity so all that remains for us to actually solve the basel problem now is to evaluate this sum and then take the limit well that's that's perfectly fine but to do that is not going to be trivial it's not going to be linear in the sense it will look like a, a detour what i'm going to do now but in the end it will all work out first of all we take uh, e to the i n theta and write as e to the i theta to the n. This is the Moivre's theorem. And that translates into cosine n theta plus i sine n theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta, the whole thing raised to the nth power. Okay. So if we divide everything by sine theta to the n, we're gonna get uh, cosine theta plus i sine theta whole thing to the n over sine to the sine of theta to the n which becomes cotangent theta plus i whole thing raised to n now on this cotangent theta plus i to the n we can use the binomial expansion and we get n choose zero cot n 
cot to the n of theta plus n choose one cot to the n minus one theta times i and uh, so on plus then the the second last term which is n choose n minus one cot theta i to the n minus one plus n choose n i to the n now we can group the real and imaginary terms here so the real terms are going to be n choose zero cot theta to the n minus n choose two cot theta to the n minus two plus or minus you know so on and then the imaginary terms are going to be actually the odd terms so so plus i times n choose one cotangent of theta n minus to the n minus one minus n choose three cot theta to the n minus three plus or minus so on we can equate the imaginary parts now so when we do that the imaginary parts of this uh this uh, left side to the imaginary parts of this right side well we know the imaginary parts of the right side we just wrote them out like this segregated them out from the real ones the imaginary parts of the left side are just this sign this this ratio of signs so sign of n theta over sine to the of theta to the n that's the imaginary part so when i do that i get this and then n choose one which is you know basically the imaginary part n choose one cotangent theta to the n minus one minus n choose three cot theta to n minus three plus or minus so on we can again go with our standard choice that we had before theta equals k pi over 2n plus 1 where k is an integer between 1 and n both inclusive and small n equals 2 times capital n plus 1 i'm going to justify this choice soon why k has to be an integer between 1 and n but for now let's just go along with it so when i when i do that i'm going to have sine sine of n theta is actually going to be sine of k pi and k is an integer so sine of integer times pi is zero on the other hand n is two times capital n plus one so i you know just put that choice in and see the right hand side of the equation is actually cotangent to the two capital n over times uh, of k pi over 2n plus one minus 2n plus one choose three cotangent 2n minus two of k pi over 2n plus 1 plus or minus all of that sum equals 0 because the sine of k pi is 0 so now if we define the polynomial 2n plus 1 choose 1 tn minus 2n plus 1 choose 3 t to the n minus 1 plus or minus so on then based on this yellow equation here we can see that if we plug in instead of t if we plug in cotangent squared of k pi over 2n plus 1 for you know k is an integer between 1 and n inclusive the, the that's the root because that sets according to this yellow equation this entire polynomial to zero so that means the roots this uh, this function cotangent squared of k pi over 2n plus 1 for k between 1 and n inclusive these guys are the roots of the polynomial p of t let's call them t of k and there's k roots but the question is are are these all the roots more precisely what happens if k equals you know k ec actually exceeds if we take k to be more than n and anything that's more than n can be uh, generally written as p times n plus m where p is actually greater than or equal to 1 and m is between 0 and n minus 1 so this is a general form of some uh, integer that's greater than n what happens when that situation occurs and this is more more or less justifying the choice of bounding k between 1 and n so if we consider theta as you know pn plus m over 2n plus 1 pi we can uh, you know do some algebra which i'm not going to dictate um, whose steps i'm not going to dictate all the way to get pi plus p minus 2n plus m minus 1 over 2n plus 1 whole thing to the pi or times pi and then we see that cotangent squared of pi plus x equals cotangent squared of x and then 
we have established a reduction relationship. So if we have uh, the angle as Pn plus m over 2n plus 1 pi, that equals cotangent squared of like P is reduced by 2. So P minus 2 times n plus m minus 1. So m is reduced by 1, P is reduced by 2 over 2n plus 1 pi. So, you know, we've established the re a, re a reduction relationship. So we can just reduce, we can just do this m times and then that means we get rid of this m factor. So we're just left with P minus 2m whole thing times n over 2n plus 1 pi in the argument. Let's call P minus 2m r. And uh, we can, uh, you know, still reduce it further. Now we are at this point where if r minus 2 times n minus 1 is less than, is in the range of 1 and n, we terminate this process, this algorithm of reduction. Else we repeat with p, like whatever p we had, this we had some general p before. Repeat this entire algorithm, but with p changed to r minus 3 and m changed to n minus 1. Keep repeating this algorithm and you know this algorithm will terminate because p is actually getting smaller and smaller at each reduction stage. So that means the this choice of 1, k between 1 and n exhausts all unique values. This was, you know, for this reduction was for k greater than n. We can do a similar argument for, for the negative side of things because uh, the cotangent squared is an even function. But the idea is that k between 1 and n inclusive exhausts all unique values. Everything else is just after reduction. This reduction algorithm is just a repeat, a copy of this. So that means p of t has n roots because you know there's only n unique values uh, given the choice of k. You can also see that you know uh, p of t has n roots because p of t has order n, the highest uh, the highest power of p of t, the degree of p of t is n, and there, therefore by the fundamental theorem of algebra has n roots. So all in all, you know. Either we, we proceed using this reduction algorithm to justify the choice of 1 and n, or we argue from the fundamental theorem of algebra, you know, knowing beforehand that we're going to encounter a polynomial like this. We can, uh, we're justifying the choice of k being between 1 and n, both inclusive. Okay, now this, this, this was quite a detour. We have to get back on track. And to get back on track, which is to evaluate the cotangent squared sum, or more, more precisely to work with the polynomial P of T that we have, whose roots are the cotangent expression, we have to use something known as Vieta's theorem. So for Vieta's theorem, if we have a polynomial of order n, of, uh, more precisely degree n, if it's degree n, then the leading coefficient has to be non-zero. Otherwise, it will be degree n minus 1. We can factor that coefficient a0 out. We get xn plus a a1, a sub 1 over a0, x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a n over a0. Then, if q of x is 0, that means q of x over a0, which is basically, you know, the thing in the bracket, is also zero because you know a naught is non-zero. So if q of x is zero, then a naught a naught non being not being zero, the thing inside the bracket, which is precisely q of x over a naught, has to be zero. So that therefore, if x i for i between one and n are the roots of q of x, then you know by definition of being roots, q of x i is zero. That means q of x i over a naught is also zero. So, so the roots of q of x are q of x are the same as the roots of q of x over a naught, which is you know this, uh, this polynomial whose leading coefficient is one. Now, using the 
the remainder factor theorem. We know that Q of X over A naught can be factorized like this x minus x1 x minus x2 dot dot x minus xn where x1 2 till n are the roots of q and also the roots of uh, this q of x over a naught so if we compare the if we if we expand this out and uh, you know we expand to just the to just the powers xn and xn minus 1 we see the coefficient of xn is 1 after expanding the, the right hand side and the coefficient of xn minus 1 is actually minus x1 plus x2 plus dot 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 xn why is that because because to make up xn minus 1 the only independent uh, the only uh, free choice we have is to choose uh, any one of these factors because if if we have to make xn minus 1 we will choose n minus 1 x terms from from these uh these factors so we'll choose n minus one factors for its x terms and then we have we are left with one degree of freedom to choose to you know make uh when we're when we're doing a product and uh that degree of freedom well there's n degrees of freedom you can either choose x1 and choose the rest or x2 and the rest so on until xn and, the, and all the rest all the rest will make up xn minus 1 and that matches the coefficient on the right hand side which is a1 over a naught so comparing coefficients we know that the sum of the roots x1 x2 until xn is actually minus a1 over a naught so that's weirdest theorem that's the basically the main result we're going to need because if we look at this polynomial here we know that the cotangent squared of k pi over 2 n plus 1 for k between 1 and n inclusive is the is the root of p of t which is you know given here therefore by Vieta's theorem if we sum the roots that has to be equal to the to minus the second last uh the the sub leading terms coefficient or the leading terms coefficient so sub leading term is the you know the who, which has degree one less than the the degree of the polynomial so in this case that's going to be the n minus one terms coefficient which is going to be 2n plus 1 choose 3 divided by the leading coefficient which is 2n plus 1 choose 1 since it already has a minus sign that cancels with the minus sign from Vieta's theorem formula so we get 2n plus 1 choose 3 divided by 2n plus 1 choose 1. We expand, you know, the definition of the combination coefficient. Uh, so we get 2n plus 1 factorial over 3 factorial times 2n minus 2 factorial times 2n factorial over 2n plus 1 factorial. We sum the, the tk because that was the formula. We're summing over the roots. The roots are just cotangent squared k pi over 2n plus 1. k is going from 1 to capital N. And uh, the right hand side just results in 2n times 2n minus 1 over 6. So all we have to do is just plug it into this, uh, this inequality relationship we had. So we get pi, we can pull out the pi squared and the 6 in anticipation. So pi squared over 6 times limit n goes to infinity of 2n times 2n minus 1 over 2n plus 1 whole squared less than or equal to sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k squared which is the basel problem less than or equal to again pull the pi squared and the 6 out in anticipation pi squared over 6 limit n goes to infinity of 2n times 2n minus 1 over 2n plus 1 whole squared now both these limits are the same the leading term is 4n squared in the numerator as well as in the denominator and that's all we care about in the limit as n goes to infinity so since both the leading terms coefficients are the same and both are of order n squared the limit becomes one on both sides the same limit so in the end we're lower bounded by so pi squared over six less than or equal to the basel problem less than or equal to pi squared over six so by the squeeze theorem we have sum from k equals one to infinity one over k squared is equal to pi squared over six so this is one hell of a proof there were so many detours like Vieta's theorem 
and uh, and also this uh, this complex analysis polynomial stuff which you know which which is what makes it elegant because the person who thought about this proof to be precise it was Koshi this is Koshi's proof he was definitely a genius you can see that in the elegance of these steps all you need is Vieta's theorem and some you know algebra in the sense of the binomial expansion and uh, you know some well-known results like uh, you know Euler's formula and the Moivre's theorem the rest of it you know finding the inequalities is, is comes from the simplest of things like geometry we have here but all in all everything considered and you know the way we actually find what the the value of this sum is using Vieta's theorem very ingeniously is what makes this proof one of my favorite proofs so far so see you in the next video guys thanks for watching peace out